All right. Well, good morning and welcome to uh, River Oaks Church Online. Uh, and I have to be honest here, this is odd. I'm looking at a camera and I'm all looking at an, an, an empty sanctuary. And, and so it's a little surreal. Uh, and so on, on one hand, I know that each one of us, we, we want to be together. We want to uh, have uh, this side-by-side worship time and, and fellowship with one another. Uh, and we're going to miss that. And we do miss it. We miss it already. And it's only been a week. Last week, Brandon preached. And, and we were all gathered together. And, and it seems like forever ago. And our hearts are longing for what we already had. But on the other hand, I tell you what, I'm so thankful that we have the technology. And I'm thankful for Brandon for being able to have the wisdom to put all this together and make it work so we can come into your homes and to share the truth of God's word with you and have a little fun with it. But keep church uh, going when we can't uh, meet uh, together. But I am looking forward to the day when they say, hey, it's all clear, this is over, we got through this, and we have now a new normal that we have to face. But boy, am I looking forward to to getting together and worshiping uh, side by side with you once again. But until then, we're going to keep making the best of what we can do. We're going to keep doing what we're doing. We're going to record, and we're going to keep this going. Um, and, and I think we're going to find some real blessings through it. And so I want you to look for those blessings in this time, this difficult situation. Uh, for instance, man, this is a great time for you to grab your family together and do church in your home together. Moms and dads, grab your kids, pray for them, uh, you know, seek God's best for them, uh, you know, get them up and get them going and, and get them doing church, uh, you know, just side by side. Uh, you can even include Fido in the mix at this point. Uh, but, uh, and then I, I would say talk to, to them after the sermon. You know, talk to them about what you heard, and, and, and I think you might just be surprised at the conversations that, that come out of this. Um, God is going to bless this in ways that we probably can't imagine. So let him bless it and seek his face through it. So I want to pray for us, and then uh, Brandon's going to come up and, uh, and uh, lead us in, in worship like we, we do every week. But I just want to just pray for you as a church, as your pastor. So bow your hearts and heads. Father, we just um, come to you, and I, I just pray. Father, I miss my family here at River Oaks Church. I miss them, and I long for the day that we get back. But until then, may you keep us strong, may you keep us safe, and may you keep us seeking your heart. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, Brandon is going to take over and lead us in a couple of songs. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn Till I met you I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my Till I met you Oh, and you call my name Cause when you call my name I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day You call my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day Now your mercy has saved my soul Now your mercy has saved my soul Now your freedom is all that I know 
the old made new. Jesus, when I met you, oh, when you call my name, because when you call my name, I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day. You call my name. darkness into your glorious day oh I needed rescue I needed rescue my sin was heavy but chains break at the weight of your glory I needed shelter I was an orphan now you call me a citizen of heaven when I was broken you were my healing now your love is the air that I'm breathing I have a future my eyes are open cause when you call my name darkness into your glorious day you call my name and I ran out of that grave oh yeah out of the darkness into your glorious day Amen. Amen. Oh, man, it's good to worship with you today. We're going to sing one more song, and, and we're singing to the God of miracles this morning. We're singing to God who, who can change hearts and change lives. Look, we're singing to a God who heals sickness, a God of miracles. So let's sing to that end. one who made the blind to see is moving here in front of me moving here in front of me the one who made the deaf to hear is silencing my every fear silencing my every fear I believe in you, I believe in you, you're the God of miracles, I believe in you, I believe in you, you're the God of miracles. He's doing miracles even today. Even today. The one who does impossible. The one who does impossible is reaching out to make me whole. He's reaching out to make me whole. The one who put death in his place His life is flowing through my veins His life is flowing through my veins I believe in you I believe in you You're the God of miracles I know, I know I believe in you I believe in you, you're the God of miracles, I believe in you, I believe in you, you're the God of 
the power of the risen one the God who brings the dead to life you're the God of miracles the God of miracles the God the God who was in The power of the risen world The God who brings the dead to life You're the God of miracles The God of miracles I believe in you I believe in you you're the God of miracles, and you're working today, Lord. You're working today. I believe in you. I believe in you. You're the God of miracles. Oh, lift this up, church. Come on. I believe in you. I believe in you. You're the God. God of miracles I believe in you I believe in you You're the God of miracles God we come before you believing in your miracles and what you can do even today Lord, maybe there's someone listening right now on their couch. Maybe they're holding their kid's hand or, or around some loved ones. I don't know, but God, you can do amazing things. I pray even today someone would come to know you. Someone would come to rely on you, put their faith in you, make you Lord of their life. And God, we just lift this up in your precious and holy name. Amen. All right, well, now it's time for... Uh well, really, it's time for our announcements. So we just need Chris. Hmm. What to read? What to read? Chris! Oh, wait. Now we're talking. The Hidden Flame. Chris! Mr. Sanchez! She said, you had me at hello. Where are you? Oh, I'm definitely checking out this book. <laughs> oh, can't wait to take this home, get a little fire going, a little hot chocolate. Oh, oh no, I still have a book out. How to Bromance My Pastor. Oh, I better turn that back in. All right, we, Weller, he's in the library. I don't know what he could possibly be doing in the library right now. Anyway, there's only one announcement that we need to make, and that is go on our website, and there's a little link now, and that link will bring you to our YouTube page, which is up and running now. It has videos, some from last year, and you'll be able to catch our sermons on there. Also, be looking very soon, we're going to have another spot on there where you can send in your tithe and offering by online. But for now, you still need to send it in uh, through the mail at 550 Highway T, Forestdale, Missouri, 63348. That's 550 Highway T, Forestdale, Missouri, 63348. Uh, as we get going this morning, I want to remind you of a little history. When Franklin Delano Roosevelt became the 32nd president of the United States in 1933, the nation was going through a major crisis that's called the Great Depression. Um, the Roaring Twenties had been an unprecedented time of expansion 
uh, and people, uh, normal people, uh, you know, common folk wanted to begin investing in the stock market. And so everyone put their money in the stock market. Everyone was having a good time. And then production began to decline. Unemployment rates began to rise. Wages were low. And what happened was it left stock prices at a, a much higher value than they actually were. And uh, the inevitable happened, and on Tuesday, October 24th, Black Tuesday, 1929, uh, we had the Great Depression beginning. The banks failed. 11,000 out of 24,000 banks went completely under, and so people had lost all of their savings. They, they, they couldn't even, whatever money they had, they couldn't even go get, so they lost everything. That put millions of people out of work, millions of men out of work, and they were seeking jobs. Others who had jobs barely had enough uh, to get by. Uh, and then the 30s hit. And uh, from Texas all the way up through Nebraska, because of the way they plowed and the things they had in place, the Dust Bowl days began. And uh, we just had the, the Midwest section of the United States were turned into just nothing but dirt. And great storms of dust rose, and, and things were, were pretty bleak. Uh, and this is the time in which FDR came uh, to be the president of the United States. And in his first inaugural address, I want to read a section of it, March 4th, 1933. He was very candid, and he, and he said up front, and I think we need some honest talk, but he was uh, a, a, a man who just put it the way it was. And this is what he said. He said, I will address the nation with candor and a decision which the present situation of our nation impels. This is preeminently the time to speak the truth, the whole truth, frankly and boldly. We need not shrink from honesty facing conditions in our country today. This great nation will endure as it has endured. It will revive and will prosper. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror, which paralyzes needed efforts to convert, retreat, and to advance. And so what I would like to talk to you this morning about is facing our fears, uh, much like they did way back then in 1932. Uh, but I wanted to face them because we can find hope. We really can. We can find hope in, even in the midst of all this uncertainty. You know, I started thinking about this time in my life and then I started looking back over the, the years that I've, I've been alive. And, and I remember, as a nation, we faced all sorts of crises. Um, as a young boy, I remember watching the nightly news and the Vietnam War and the casualty reports and all the protests. And then they had the fall of Saigon and everything was kind of haywire. Uh, my dad was involved in the Air Force with the nuclear uh, preparedness program. And I remember mock drills where we had to go on the Air Force base and they had a nuclear explosion and so people were wrapped up with fake wounds and different things. And, and I remember uh, that very, very keenly because it, it just left such an impression upon my heart. I said, wow, is this going to happen? Is this going to be real? See, back then we had the East-West conflict. The Cold War was raging. And, and so it was, you know, kind of a time of uncertainty. Maybe not like right now, but certainly was uncertain. And then in the 70s, we had the gas prices. You know, the, the, they, they went crazy and had all those big cars and the lines were just for endless. And then they dropped the, the, the speed limit down to 55 to try to save, serve, uh, reserve gas because they said, well, we're going to run out. We're not going to have enough and it's going to be horrible. And then there's the Iran hostage crisis that lasted 444 days from 1979 to 1980, <clears throat> I remember those times and the fear that what's going to happen around the world. Then, of course, 9-11 happened, and it gripped the nation in uh, fear uh, because we had a new enemy, terrorism, on our front doorstep. And then not that long ago, in 2009, we had the H1N1, the swine flu virus that killed over 12,000 in our own nation. And yet we're still here. And so we've had lots and lots of crises, lots of things that we as a nation, an individual have faced, and we've come out on the other side. And those were difficult times. They were fearful times. And at the beginning of them, no one knew how they would end. But here we are. And so I just want to encourage you with that. Will things change? Probably. Are, are things different? Well, 
they are right now. Uh, they're really different, and we're doing things, and we have to be different, and maybe that's going to last for some time. I don't know. But I want to assure you, I believe that we're going to get through this and come out on the other side better than, than uh, where we entered into it. But here's what I want us to focus on. If all we do is get through this, then I believe we will miss what God is doing in this. And I don't want to miss that. I don't want to miss what God is doing. And I, I think all of us have gotten comfortable in life. Uh, I think we've taken things for granted because how many of us thought that there would be a run on toilet paper and we wouldn't have any? I got up at 5.30 the other day to go get some toilet paper and guess what? There wasn't any to be found. I never thought I would see the days when restaurants would close. I never thought I would see the day when Walmart wouldn't be open for 24 hours. In fact, they've shrunk their, their hours back again and again. And I, I thought, well, you know what? The only time I would see shelves empty is if there's a, a, a real crisis when tornadoes or something came through. But we have empty shelves now. I never thought I would be concerned uh, for my parents as I am right now. Or my daughter, who's in Honduras, and she couldn't get out even if she wanted to. And they've kind of basically instated a case of martial law down there. I've never been so concerned about people I know who I care about deeply. Some of our older members and some of those people in our church that have underlying health issues. And I'm concerned for them. My point is simply this. God has got my attention. Does he have yours? Does he have your attention? And I, I think that's, that's really important because when God tries to get our attention, it's called grace. God's grace gets our attention. And I think he's shaking the world so that we would look at him. He's changing our circumstances so that we would stop being complacent. He's putting us into the unknown so that we have to trust him through it. He's causing our hearts to turn so that we know that we serve almighty God. And we need to, to, to have our, our hearts rent a little bit and have our attention and focus back upon him. You know, I, I think back over the last 20 years, um, I've always had a year verse. Every year that I preached, I've, I've done a year verse. And this year we even talked about, and back in December we talked about, eh, maybe we're not going to have a year verse this year. And I really weighed that and thought about it. And then I thought, you know, no, I, I really want a year verse. And I asked the Lord what to, to do. And he impressed upon me Ephesians 3.20, which is now to him who is to able to do abundantly beyond all that we think or ask according to the power at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through it all through all generations, forever and ever, amen. And I thought, boy, that takes on new meaning today. I think that verse tells me that God can do more. I think that verse tells me that God can grow a church in the midst of this. I think that tells me that God can restore families in the midst of this. And I believe that God is going to draw people to himself through the midst of this. I think God is not done. I think he's beginning. And I think he's stirring things up so that he can be honored and that he can do things that are beyond my own imagination. But is this scary? Yeah. Is it surreal? Absolutely. Uh, is it odd? Yes. But the question I think we need to wrestle with is how are we going to face it? And how are we going to find hope? I mean, that's, that's what we, we need to ask ourselves. How do we find hope in uncertainty? How do we face this and allow our faith to rise above any fears that we may have. So I want you to take your Bibles and turn with me to Matthew chapter 8. Uh, we're going to look at a familiar story, uh, one that I, I referenced when I sent that uh, little message out by Chip Ingram. And uh, it's about Jesus in the boat calming the sea. So let's read that passage and, and see what God has to speak to our hearts today. <clears throat> Excuse me, Matthew says this, And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by waters. But he was asleep, and they went out and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, O oh, you of little faith? And then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? 
And I think one of the first things that we need to understand here is that storms come into our lives suddenly and without warning. The Sea of Galilee is actually 608 feet below sea level. Now, just north of it is a big mountain called Mount Hormon, and it is 9,200 feet above sea level. So that's, a, that's a, almost a 10,000-foot drop between Mount Hermon and the Sea of Galilee. And what happens is the winds off the coast, uh, the Mediterranean coast, come blowing in, and they get cold going over the mountain. And when they come down the mountain, there's a bunch of valleys and ravines that go uh, north and south and head right down to the Sea of Galilee. And when that cold air hits the warm air that's, that's in that basin of the Sea of Galilee, I mean, storms just suddenly come up, and they're normally very, very, very strong sorts of storms. And the disciples... You know, those that lived in that region, at least five of them lived in that region, and they were all fishermen. I mean, they knew this. They, they had seen this uh, most of their lives, and so this isn't new to them. So what I want you to do is kind of put yourself in that boat with them uh, on the Sea of Galilee and, and understand it's at night, the wind's beginning to blow, it's dark, the waves become stronger and stronger. And in verse 24, it says the waves begin to swamp the boat. In other words, those waves were breaking over the boat. They were coming from left and right and from front and back. And, and so all of them had to be soaked. And all of them were, were, were a, a little frightened by all of this. I, I doubt they could see the shore if they could. They were thinking, you know, I don't know how we're going to get there. I'm sure they were rowing, doing the best as they, uh, that they could. <clears throat> I'm sure someone started bailing water out as, as much as they could because that water is coming in left and right. And these men were scared, and they were seasoned fishermen. So they, they knew what was at stake. They understood that they were in real trouble. So this was more than just dicey. This was deadly. And, and so they were, they were frightened by this storm. You know, Matthew uses an interesting word uh, for the word storm. It's seismos. It's the word we get seismology from and that measures earthquakes. And I think the picture there is, is of God shaking things up. And if, if you took a bowl or I, I think I mean walking across with a, a cup full of coffee, you know, you always walk real steady because if you start shaking a little bit, that it bubbles out. It, it washes back and forth and comes out of the cup. Well, imagine the Sea of Galilee, God shaking it, and the waves just going back and forth, back and forth. That's the picture that we have. And then both Mark and Luke and the other accounts of the same story, they say a fierce gale of wind. So this is just rocking their world right now. And I'll be honest, it's kind of how I feel. I don't know about you, but that's kind of how I feel. My world is rocked just a little bit. I don't know if you heard about it, but there was a, a group of rafters, um, and they had been on the, in, inside the, the Grand Canyon for 25 days, they, you know, 25 days. They, they, they went there at the end of, of February, last week in February, and they didn't have any cell phone reception. And so when they finally got through rafting after 25 days, their phones just blew up, and, and they were like, oh my goodness, what's happening in the world? And, and like a tidal wave, it just, all this information about no toilet paper and coronavirus and all the deaths in Italy and all of that um, just hit their phones, and they, were, they just couldn't believe what happened. That's not what happened with us. I mean, if, if you've been through this and you haven't been on a rafting boat for 25 days, then what I feel like is that all this news has just been like one wave after the other wave after the other wave after the other wave hitting us. I mean, the first time we heard was, oh, things might shut down. And then it was, well, you can't have gatherings of a thousand or more. And then it was 250 and we had church. And then that same night, last week, uh, we had 50. And then it was brought down to 10. Then we heard oh, the NBA is going to be suspended because they have a couple of players that have the virus. Uh, March Madness, we're going to play it, but we're not going to have any fans. And then it was canceled. We're going to have high school basketball, but then they got canceled. We're going to have school, and it's just going to be an extended couple weeks of spring break, and that got canceled. And then we have social distancing, and, and that's okay, but just separate yourself in the restaurants. Restaurants only can be at 50% capacity, and now they're closed and drive up only. Bars and businesses <coughs> are now uh, done. No toilet paper, no hand san sanitizers, nothing on the shelves. And then we heard the numbers. If you're like me, I watched the news, and then you heard the numbers. Well, there's a case, and now there's two, and then there's 15 
and now you know understand that uh, uh, Cal or California shut down their borders, and other nations or other states may also do that. Wave after wave after wave. I feel like I'm in the boat, don't you? I mean, I feel like I'm just being rocked, and the waves are filling up the boat, and none of us saw it coming. All of us are sort of blindsided by this coronavirus storm. Everyone but God. God knew it all. He knew the storm. He knows the size of the storm. He, he knows the waves that break over our lives. See, the storms get our attention. They waken us to a new reality. And I think in many ways, and I think this is really, really important for us to understand, in many ways, God's grace right now is shouting to us, now that I have your attention, now that I got your focus, don't go back to normal. When this is all over, stay up here. Don't go back to the, the humdrum routine of, of your life. I mean, stay focused on me. And I, I, I think we could ask ourselves a, a few questions. What's most important right now? Is it God or sports? Is it God or business? Is it stuff or family? Is it activities or church? And I think you all would say the same thing. Man, God is most important. Boy, do I miss church. Man, I want to be around my family. And, and so, again, don't just get through this. Grow from this. Make God uh, your priority because I think that's what he's doing. He's given us this great opportunity to re reprioritize our life and get them focused on him. See, I think he's shaking our world and causing the waves just so we stop and, and, and look up. Mom and dads, listen, grab your kids, hug them and pray for them. You know, husbands, grab your wives, wives, grab your husbands. And, and, and you know, by distance, grab our parents and, and grab our little ones and, and just pray to them. If you grab your kids, teach them that life is short but precious but eternity is better and forever. Ask those that you know that don't know Jesus, well, what if this goes south? What if this gets bad? Ask them what they think. Begin to, to, to talk to them about the things that are important. So I think what God would say to us is, I've got your attention, keep it there. I think there's another thing we learned from this lesson, uh, from this little story here, and, and I, I think it's important. And the question is, where is Jesus? He's in the boat. He's in the boat. This storm came up suddenly and fiercely, but Jesus was with them in the midst of the storm. He rode it out with them. He didn't just say, hey, guys, take off. You know, I'll catch up with you. No, he was in the boat. Now, he was asleep. We'll talk about that in a minute. But he was in the boat with them. And I think as Christians, we need to understand when the storms of life come up, the things that, that we have to go through, we are never alone. We may be by ourselves. But we are never alone. Jesus is always with us. Um, you know, God promises that he will never forsake us. He will never leave us. He won't toss us aside. In fact, I love what David wrote in Psalm 27, 5. He said, he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. Man, that's, that's so precious. He will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He told Joshua, and Joshua was afraid. He's about ready to enter into the promised land and go take Jericho. He made a promise to him. He says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Paul wrote in the book of Philippians, he goes, I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. In, every, in, every, in any and every circumstances, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, of abundance and need. I can do th all things through him who strengthens me. Now, he could say that because he knew that God was always with him. He can be content because God was right there to strengthen him. So no matter what he faced, always, 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 he knew that God would be right there. And that's the same for us. God will always, always, always be right there for you. He's not going to leave you. He's not going to forsake you. He's right there with you. He's with us in this storm. And you can trust him. You can count on him. He's there for you to lean on. He's there for you to ask for wisdom. He's there for you to ask for guidance. He's always there for you, even when you're scared and you don't know what's going on. And there have been times that I've been worried and anxious. that like, God, what's happening? He's always there and he will hear you. He will hear your heart and he will meet you where you are. But some of you have been thinking and maybe feeling like the disciples. 
you're in the midst of the storm, but like the disciples, Jesus was asleep in the boat. If you read all three accounts, it says he made a little cushion for his head, and, and there he went fast asleep. And that tells us in his humanity he was exhausted. Big day, busy ministering, and he gets in the boat, and he's, he's exhausted, and he goes to sleep. But like all the other disciples, you know he had to be soaked. And yet, he wasn't awake. And so the disciples had to go and wake him up to get his attention. Now, I thought about that, and I, I thought, do you think all of a sudden they said, oh, hey, hey let's go wake up Jesus and, and go to wake up, or do you think they had a, a little bit of discussion going on before that as they were bailing out and looking at the storm get worse and worse, and, and, and I, I think they had some discussion uh, going on amongst themselves, maybe a little quietly, maybe a little underneath their breath, and maybe they said something like, I can't believe he's still asleep. How can anyone sleep through something like this? How could he sleep at a time like this? Doesn't he care what's happening? Doesn't he care about me? I mean, that's, that's what we think when our prayers go unanswered, when they seem that, that God isn't listening, that he's somehow asleep. And we say to ourselves, why doesn't he answer the way I want him to answer? Doesn't he know that my boat's filling up? Doesn't he know that these waves are crashing over? Doesn't he care at all for me? You know, I think sometimes if we're honest, that's how we feel. Jesus, I'm bailing water left and right, and I'm not keeping up, and I'm afraid. Where are you? I think that's exactly how the disciples felt, because when they woke him up, this is what they said. Matthew tells us, they said, save us, Lord, we're perishing. And that says their, their immediate need was to be saved. They, they thought they were going down. I don't think they thought they were going to make it to shore. Matthew, or excuse me, Luke says, Master, Master, we're perishing. And by saying Master, Master twice, they were emphasizing it. And they were saying, man, we're, we're desperate. This is an immediate need. Man, I, I need you now, Jesus. But Mark put a little emotion with it. Mark said, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? So I think what that tells us is that they had gotten all worked up because they ran out of options. I, I, I think they were worked up for two reasons. First, clearly they did not trust God. See, if they trusted God, they would have been at rest like Jesus. Now, that doesn't mean they wouldn't be rowing, they wouldn't be working and bailing and stuff like that, but they would be at peace. They would be at rest. They would say, God's got this storm. See, Jesus was asleep because he trusted in God. See, the storm didn't matter to him because he knew that God allowed the storm and he can trust God within the storm until he get out of the storm. So Jesus went to sleep. He knew that God's will would be done. And so the disciples didn't trust God. They didn't trust God through the storm. I think the second thing that it tells us is they didn't seek Jesus first. I think they worked, I think they bailed, I think they rode, I think they tried anything and everything they could until they finally said, you know, maybe we ought to go seek a little divine intervention here. Maybe we ought to go wake up Jesus. See, I can relate to that one, can't you? That we try and try and try, we go out and buy this, we go do this, we go provide, we go get all of our stuff. Some, some people are hoarding and doing all this instead of just simply trusting in God and walking. We have a, a nation that is in fear. And they're living and working out of their fear instead of their faith. See, the truth is that sometimes instead of going to God first, we wait until we've done all that we could. And then we go and seek him out. But in the meantime, as we're bailing and bailing and, and, and getting worried, we're, we're in our hearts what we're saying is, you know, God, why don't you do something? God, why aren't you fixing this? God, why aren't you stopping the coronavirus from sweeping across the nation? Why aren't you, you know, you're protecting my job or protecting my family or doing you know, anything? And we may shoot up an emergency prayer, oh God, save us, but we haven't really sought him. We haven't put our faith and trust in him. And what we've really done is we've allowed fear to trump our faith. And that's exactly what the disciples did. They woke up Jesus with the question, don't you care? That's what they said. They woke up Jesus with the question, don't you care? Now, think about that for a moment. He was asleep. He was out. 
You know, for all practical purposes, he didn't know the storm was going. He didn't know how bad it was. He didn't know that they were in trouble. And yet they woke him up with a question, don't you care? See, faith would have woke him up with a different question. Faith would have woke him up with, what should I do? How do you want me to respond? Fear woke him up with, don't you care? And that's why Jesus said, why are you afraid? You have little faith. See, fear trumped their faith. See, fear always doubts whether God can or whether God cares. See, if he cares but can't do anything, then we have fear. If he can do something but doesn't care and therefore he doesn't do anything, then we have fear. But I got to tell you, we know that God cares and we know that God can. And if God cares and he can, then there is no need to allow fear to trump our faith. We must simply trust God. We must allow uh, the truth that God can and God cares to, to, to grip us with faith instead of being gripped with that old fear. So we're in the midst of a storm. What question are you asking? What should I do? Or God, don't you care? Is it faith or is it fear? But one last thing that we need to see in this text this morning is, is simply this. Jesus is ultimately in control of the storm. I love this. Verse 26, it says he, he rose. You know, they, they wake him up. He rose. Mark says, peace, be still. And then the waves stop, the wind stops, and everything was calm. That's a miracle all by itself. Not just stopping the wind, but that it, suddenly it was calm. It wasn't like it had to slow down. It was calm immediately. See, when God wants the storm to be over, all he has to say is, peace, be still, and it's done. It's done. It, it, calm comes. Sometimes, though, God has to bring us to a point of desperation to get our attention. And that's why that boat had to be rocked so much. He had to get to a point of desperation before they turned to Jesus. And if he hasn't got our attention yet, why would he stop the storm? He wants to get our attention. He wants our heart and focus to be totally on him. You know, I heard of a couple different times of prayer uh, for our nation. Grace and I have uh, decided that at 8 o'clock, there's a, there's a little thing going around that at 8 o'clock, stop everything and pray for a minute. So we've set our alarms, and at 8 o'clock, alarm goes off, we turn everything off, we, we stop what we're doing, whatever's going on, and we just pray. We simply seek God for a minute or more, and uh, I, I thought about, well, what if that starts on the East Coast and works all the way to the West Coast? What if, and I'm not talking about those who don't know Jesus, I'm talking about his church. I'm talking about the people of God. What if they would just stop and pray for one minute? For one minute from East Coast to West Coast, this kind of rumble would roll through our nation of God, we love you, we thank you, we praise you, we adore you. But God, we have a need. What if he heard our praises and our pleas for a minute or two every night for the next 30 days or more? What would happen? You know, Hannah Smith posted something on Facebook, and, and I, I know it was a repost of something, um, but it was from a quote of 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 13. It's a very familiar passage, and I think we skip down to verse 14 and not read verse 13. But let me read verse 13 for you. <clears throat> it says, God's talking to Solomon. And he said, when I shut the heavens up so there's no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people. Now, I, I think it's important for us to understand, and I thought this was a little new for me, especially the locusts, but remember the fires last year that raged over California and all the fires through Austria, Australia? And they were just devastated. Both those places were devastated because there was no rain. Well, then I looked up the locusts, and, and starting in January, maybe it's the end of December, but in January, they have the largest locust swarm in parts of Africa than they've seen in at least 25 years, in some places over 70 years. There's billions of locusts, and they say it's going to devastate the whole region. Locusts are swarming there. And then, of course, we have coronavirus uh, over the whole nation. But then we get to verse 14. This is the power. He says, if my people who are called by my name 
humble themselves, pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. I think there's a principle we need to grab onto as a nation, as a people, as a church, as a family, that we need to seek the face of God. What would happen if God's people, and I'm talking about God's people, born again, brothers and sisters in Christ, what would happen if they humbled themselves, sought his face, turned from their wicked ways? I believe God would respond with compassion. I believe that God, moved by compassion, would calm the storm. Peace, be still. I think God is a gracious and good God and simply wants our attention to be put back on him where it belongs. So let me close with this. How are we going to turn our fear into faith? How are we going to be gripped by faith rather than be gripped by fear? Well, I think it's the same way the disciples were. At the very end of that, that story, that account, they say, what sort of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? Matthew and Luke says, they marveled at him. Mark says this, when the storm came, they were afraid. When they saw Jesus calm it, it says they were terribly afraid. They were greatly afraid. They were more afraid of God in the boat with them that Jesus calmed the storm with his voice than the storm that they were afraid of before. You know, when Job saw God through the circumstances of his life, he said, I've heard you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. When Isaiah saw the Lord in that beautiful passage in Isaiah 6, he says, when he saw the Lord high and lifted up, he said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. In other words, what comes out of me is, ugh. And he repents. When Daniel saw God, this man, and even after this account in Daniel 10, the angel says, man, Daniel, you are highly esteemed. But when he saw God, he fell on his face and he said he couldn't get up and his knees and his arms trembled because he came face to face with God. See, I believe that if all we're going to do is to just get through this, then we miss what God is doing in this. And I don't want to just get through this. I want us to grow through it. I want us to long for God. I want us to, 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 to just desire God more than anything else. And that's what he wants. Because his best for us is himself. And if our heart and our lives are focused on Jesus Christ and our relationship with God through our Lord and Savior, then that's the best that we can ever have. And so the question, how do we get through this? I think first and foremost, there's two things. First and foremost, we need to humble ourselves, repent, and turn to Almighty God. So I'm going to challenge you at the end of this when we say amen and Brandon comes up and sings his song and does that, that you grab your family and you just get real honest with God. Moms and dads, get real honest. Kids, get real honest with your parents. Repent and seek God. Say, man, we, we put other stuff first. Man, we, we were complacent. We got, we got so used to stuff that, that we were just going through the motions. Thank you, God, for getting our attention. Thank you for the storm so that our heart looks up to you. So grab your family and pray. And then the second thing, I, I think it's this. We just need to realize that we can either be bewildered by the storm or we can marvel at the Lord. Which one do you want? Man, I'd rather marvel at the Lord than be overcome by the storm. See, we can either be overpowered by this thing that's crossing our nation or we can be overwhelmed by the greatness of God. I'm going to choose the greatness of God. We can focus on faith or we can focus on fear. One enslaves, one frees. And when we free ourselves from fear and focus on faith, then we find hope in the midst of all this uncertainty. Doesn't mean that I'm not afraid. Doesn't mean that I'm not concerned. Doesn't mean I have a little anxiety. Does mean that my faith is leading me. It does mean that I'm grabbing onto it with all my might and saying in the midst of my fear, in the midst of my concerns, God, I trust you. 
and I love you. And whatever you do is for my good and for the good of my family. And I will fight to be faithful and fight to be free of the fear that grips our lives in our country. So let me close with what Jesus said. In the world you will have trouble, but be of great courage, for I have overcome the world. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you sent this storm, this challenge. Thank you that you, you, you put it in our lives because I know for me, and I can only speak for myself, man, you got my attention. Me and my wife, man, man, we're just thinking all the time of, man, how thankful we are for what we have. I'm thankful in greater ways for my church family. I'm thankful for my family who lives all over the place. I'm thankful that none of this has hit them yet. I'm thankful for what you're doing in our life. I'm thankful for what you're going to do when this is all over. I'm thankful for our, our president and other leaders who are, are taking this serious and doing all that they can. I'm thankful for nurses and doctors and those who are sacrificing for others so that they can get back to health. Father, there's so much I'm thankful for. And Lord, I pray for us. Oh, Lord, I pray that you would grab our hearts and that you would draw us close and that we would learn to rest in you with a new hunger, a new thirst, a new desire for righteousness that can only come through a deep relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for watching over us. Lead us through this storm until you say, peace be still. We'll follow you. Amen. Now as for Brandon, it's going to come up and close us in a song. All right, why don't we sing this out? Because when you call my name. darkness into your glorious day when you call my name I ran out of that grave oh yeah out of the darkness into your glorious day Go make disciples. We'll see you next time.